Hi guys, let's talk energy. This one's going to be a little bit longer, a little bit more complicated, but let's go for it. Now all the energy we use comes through our food, but the output's a little bit more complicated. The ones we're going to talk about to start with are our BMR and our physical activity. Now basal metabolic rate is simply the amount of energy we need to stay alive for our everyday function. If you were to do no physical activity, how much energy would you need? Sometimes it's also called resting metabolic rate, but it's the same thing. Now let's just mention the word calorie. It's a bit confusing. One calorie raises one gram of water by one degree. Now if it's a capital C calorie, that means it's a kilocalorie. Well, actually a kilocalorie is a thousand calories with a small c. But hey, let's just call it kilocalorie is a calorie. And when you look at it on the back of a packet, you're going to read it as calories, even though it says kcal. And all the recommendations you'll get essentially mean kilocalories or large C calories. I hope that clears it up. The other one you'll see is kilojoules. Now we won't use that really, that's more about movement. So we're interested in the calories or the kilocalories. Okay, how do you work out your BMR? Well, there's some equations there to estimate your BMR. Now the variable in there is your weight, of course, because the more mass you have to your body, the more energy you need to keep it working. Now that will depend on your lean body mass and this doesn't take that into account particularly, but hey ho, it's a decent estimation. You can also estimate your energy output. If you look at energy approximation exercise sheets, they'll say that half an hour of jogging at a certain speed equals this amount of calories, for example. Now I know that depends on the individual, how you run, whether you go uphill, downhill, how much effort you put in, but it's a good estimation. So you can estimate your energy output as well, add it to your BMR, and have a good rough estimation of your total energy output. Okay, let's talk about energy balance. Now this first picture shows a seesaw that is perfectly balanced. That's called a neutral energy balance where the amount of energy you take in is exactly the same as what you expend. Now, as you'd imagine, you maintain your body weight here. You don't put on fat, you don't need to store fat, but you don't have particularly as much en enough energy to uh, make muscle. Now, if you go to a negative energy balance, this is where you're using more than you're taking in. And typically, this is the energy balance that people use when they want to lose weight, particularly fat. But of course you could lose muscle because you need energy to build muscle. And athletes would find it very hard to gain, mass, uh, to gain muscle mass when they're in this state. And a lot of energy, say, um, lots of sorry, athletes like jockeys will be in this state and they'll find it very hard to maintain uh, muscle mass. And they've been living their whole careers in negative energy balance, trying to keep the weight off whilst trying to stay athletic very, very hard and trying to maintain their energy levels. And when a jockey retires, they just love eating again because they've been starved for so long. So that's the negative energy balance. And you can imagine there'll be other sports that that applies to. Now, if we go the other way, positive energy balance, where your energy intake exceeds your energy output. This is an energy balance where you'll see a lot of people from the general population, as well as some sportsmen being. And the danger sign there is that in even a small imbalance here, will add up over time and you will gain weight. Now typically if you're not doing much exercise that weight's going to be fat as the excess energy has to be stored somewhere so it's stored as fat. However if you're working hard in the gym say you can convert that energy and use it to build muscle. So certainly um, bodybuilders in the bulking phase, uh, athletes looking to gain muscle will be in this energy state although you've got to be careful because you will store that excess energy as fat. So it's very much a balancing act, excuse the pun. Now here you can work out your energy intake per day. Now the most accurate thing you can do is weigh all your food and then look at the kilocals uh, per 100 grams. Or you can work out or estimate how many kilocals per portion. It is tricky, but give it a go and try and get your energy input per day. Then you can compare it your energy output and try and estimate whether you are in positive, a negative or neutral energy balance. It'll be interesting to see where you are. Okay, let's just mention the energy sources again. We've talked about these in individual videos, 
but interestingly you can see fats there has a higher energy density than carbohydrates and proteins but you can only use it at low intensities carbohydrates is your preferred energy source as i hope you know by now proteins you can use but you try and avoid them you try and preserve them maybe in extreme endurance events you'll be using proteins and to be honest the reality is you'll actually be using all three of these at all times it just depends on the proportion so generally if you're using more carbohydrates than others people often say you're using carbohydrates whereas actually it's going to be a proportion and the proportions change depending on your exercise levels and how much of each energy source you have left. Here's a more detailed look at energy balance. There's two other methods of energy output we haven't mentioned yet. Now dietary thermogenesis is interesting. It's the amount of extra energy you need to digest your food. And if you have healthy food, say with a lot of fibre, you actually will use more energy to digest it, which can be good for losing weight and maintaining weight. So it's just another reason to have a healthy diet. Here's a little picture of a direct calorimetry pod. Now, if you put someone in there, you could measure all the heat they produce when they exercise and get a really accurate look at their energy usage. That's not too pra practical. So a lot of sports scientists use indirect calorimetry where they measure the amount of expiratory gases that have been produced and make an estimate of energy use from that. Let's just have a quick look at some sports. Now, these figures will vary from what sources you get, but it gives you a rough idea of the amount of calories that sportsmen need to intake. Now, for example, a sumo wrestler, one extreme, will obviously intake a huge amount of calories. Yes, they're doing a lot of exercise and they'll need some of that for their physical activity, but they'll also want to store some excess energy as fat, as is pretty obvious from the picture. So their energy intake is huge, up to 20,000 calories a day. Amazing. Now, Tour de France is an interesting concept because these guys are going to be cycling every day with a few rest days for a couple of weeks. The amount of energy they use is insane. Now, some of the other sports we put up there depends on what day it is. For example, a rugby pro, if they're on a rest day, they might intake less calories. If they're on a heavy training day, it may be more. So it's going to vary depending on the sport, the individual and what they're doing. But certainly certain sports will need higher energy intake than others. Talking about the duration and the intensity of the exercise. Just looking at cycling, they need a huge amount of calories for a day of cycling. And if you imagine you're on the bike, that's very, very hard. So if you're designing a nutrition plan for a cyclist on a race day, that's incredibly hard. So that's why they have their gels and they try and snack as they go. And if you watch the Tour de France, they'll try and take bags off the side and intake um, nutrition and energy as they're going, just to try and top up their calorie intake. If they run out of calories on a steep climb at the end of the Tour de France, that could be their race over. So you need to look into the sport you're designing a diet plan for and see the practicalities of getting the amount of calories in to meet their required energy balance. It's as easy as that. No, it's pretty tricky, but research into it and it's good fun trying to get the amount, right amount of calories in over the day in a practical way that meets the energy balance your sports person needs. Okay, until next.